Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I occasionally talk about narrative, uh, torture my nemesis and uh, discuss films, TV and books. <laughs> Hello, Philip. Hello, AP. Speaking as the nemesis, let me just say what a pleasure it is to be tortured. <laughs> It is very good to have you back on the channel. We, we haven't done this in a while, my fault entirely, but we are yeah. here today to uh, discuss Dust of Dreams, Stephen Erickson's Miles and Book of the Fallen, book nine. And uh, this is going to be a spoiler-filled discussion. And filled, filled with spoilers. Well, th the point I wanted to make is I have heard Dust of Dreams described as, well, Basically, the Malazans go out onto the plane and then get run over by the Nuruk, and that's kind of it. <laughs> and technically, that does happen. Know, that yeah. that does happen. That is a significant part of the the novel. I feel that that is a slightly reductive mischaracterization, but you know what would I know? <laughs> so, like slight simplification, <laughs> I think. Yes. So I thought um, one of the ways to do this. You know my affinity for and fondness for prologues. I thought yes. if we start well known, well known. Um, if we start with at least it's not a fetish, and if we start with the prologue, that'll actually help us give a, a little bit of structure to this to talk through some of the aspects because there are some quite big ones are signaled and discussed in there, and that'll give us a bit of a framework, and then we can um, add on and develop the the later ones once we finish those. Does that does that sound good to you? That is a brilliant idea, and I'm glad I came up with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for the, the Philip Chase Best of Fantasy prologue discussion series, his original idea. <laughs> I'm just going to paste my face over yours and, and <laughs> pretend that <laughs> I'm saying all these brilliant things. All right, prologue then. Yes, uh, that makes a ton of sense, actually, because that brings up not all, but uh, quite a few of the major threads in Dust of Dreams. So uh, beginning with, I guess, the snake, that's where we start, right? Yeah, and the, the big thing, something we mentioned in the non-spoiler talk is how theme and the, the patterning of these things is really quite important to understanding what they are. So. Yeah. I know that some people, when they get to this book, they go to the ninth book in a series. We're expecting this whole convergence of plot threads and characters. Yeah, and yeah. there is a strong element of that. But they also seem dismayed because they go, well, what is this snake? This right. is another new thing. Who are these new characters coming along? And one of the things that I think helps with this, helps conceptualize it so that when you're reading it, it doesn't feel like this shock is the snake are a continuation of the chain of dogs. The snake are a continuation of an exploration of those three words that we frequently associate when we with aspects of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Children are dying. Yep. And in the chain of dogs, the refugees were seen externally. It was the military guiding them. We were with Duker. We looked at the refugees and they were viewed as a hindrance, as a baggage, as something that had to be protected. And I'm sure more than a few fan discussions are the army should have just cut their losses, cut them free and ridden off to, to save themselves, losing sight of why the army was there in the first place. And we can feel that when we identify with the, the military force looking at the refugees, this external perspective. Yeah. And we've we saw the children being crucified yep. that Kalam sees and Kalam says, I must help them and calls in Shadow Throne. Right. What we didn't really get a huge exploration of, and I know there are um, some exceptions to this, but is the perspective of children affected by the war? So children are dying. This is an articulation and showing that viewpoint. And I think that is so important that this is an extension of those previous storylines, if you will, but yeah. now showing it from another perspective. So from these the are pers not these are not the children who were crucified in Dead House Gates, but they are children who are undergoing incredible suffering and dying. 
And the, as you said uh, in the non-spoiler video, so much of this is about perspective. And as you said just now, it, we're taking the perspective of the children in this case, and it is incredibly powerful. So there is this thematic connection, uh, and that is uh, deliberate, and it is, uh, I think, very powerful when, every, when you see it in its place, when you realize what is being explored here and how relevant this is to the world we live in and to the series here as a whole, uh, it's incredibly powerful. It is not some random element that's coming out of nowhere. It is something that's been prepared for in many ways. And plot wise, it does have a place in this book too, because it is related to what's happening way over in the East where the Malazans are heading, uh, where they're ultimately you know, gonna be you know, in the next book, dealing with that. But the, the fact that you have all these refugees fleeing from that place is setting up some important plot elements too, isn't it? Yeah, because if they're fleeing, what are they fleeing? And we, we get this sense of what they are running away from is right. the thing that the Malazans are going to be barreling towards. Yep. So without doing the direct exposition of, ah, there is the evil empire. We are going to go and defeat the evil empire. This right. is a way of showing the danger, the threat, the evil empire, implying the atmosphere of dread that we should be feeling, all because we have these children running away. We have these children fleeing this. We have these children going through abject poverty, destitution, terror. They, and interestingly enough, cannibalism and it is a throwaway line in it but this they anytime a child falls that yeah. hasn't been infected by the parasite yeah. they yeah. eat their dead where have we heard this before like mm. this this again it's a, an echo a re-ringing of the bell as, as ericsson has sometimes described it memories of, of, ice. Yeah. of memories of ice it's yeah. recalling previous things the reiteration and reinvestigation of them from a different perspective. Yeah, and yeah. where we viewed the cannibalism of uh, the Pani and Domen, where we viewed that cannibalism as absolutely horrendous and monstrous, here we see the desperate need and hunger and go, well, if we were in that situation, what would we do? Yeah. And yeah. It, this is something that I, I love so dearly about these books the shift in perspective challenges easy assumptions that we make and it doesn't matter how many times ericsson does this and leads us to expect that this is going to happen it still surprises me because yeah. i'm an idiot <laughs> well uh well you're in good company i think uh, <laughs> but it's interesting too how he fleshes this out it's not only we are we getting perspective of the children, but we are getting specific children with storylines that are being fleshed out. So you have Rut at the head of this thing, who is holding, held, which is such, uh, okay, so it's obviously a, a metaphor for what, uh, what do these children need? They aren't being held. They've been abandoned. They've had to flee for their lives. Uh, this, uh, it's such a powerful, and I, I don't think that uh, it's been, well, it's something that maybe for even the next book to discuss, but this metaphor of this child called held at the head of this line of the snake um, is just so powerful. You also have Badal, uh, who is a real badass in this book, um, and uh, she performs an extremely important function when it comes to her poetry. And what is, I mean, this is a, look, this is the theme that Erickson has been talking about forever. Um, and the idea of storytelling and what is conveyed, uh, what truths can be conveyed in these poems that Bedal is, is giving us these gems that are, I, of course, you know, the two of us, we, we enjoy dissecting the poems. Uh, so that's a thing. But I think what he does with Bedal is actually really quite amazing. Um, and how he makes that a part of the snake and is hinting like he does often with the epigraphs about things you need to pay attention to with her poetry, right? And, and also uh, even the choice rut, uh, stuck in a rut, that they're, yeah. they're this 
going in this procession. Held, past tense. Yep. Why is why is the baby called something in the past tense? Not hold, but held. Yeah. Um, there there are aspects of the playful language being used. Uh, the the actually playful but expression and articulation through careful use of language, yeah. uh, because that is so much of what Badal is doing. It's about the language, and there's discussions about the power of language. The the part yeah. of the negative space of language when you take words away the ones that are left become maybe more powerful when you have more words you have a better way to articulate something the the power of language to express concepts to control to shape all of these have diegetic meanings like they're important for what badal and rut and the snake are going through yeah um but they're also that sort of more conceptual abstract thing this is an entire 10 book series that is about the power of language to shape us as reader us on this journey reading all of these books yeah um yep. and it's uh, don't they call it the the snake of is it the snake of ribs ribby snake sometimes uh, they call i know it but that. they at the beginning um they actually have a a four phrase epithet which uh or sorry, three three words in a row to describe what they are, and it's very oh. reminiscent of Chain of Dogs. Okay, but, yeah. yeah, that's one of the the ways that we see that that connection. Yeah. And yeah. when we we get their description of what's following them, right. Erickson's quite careful. There's a balance between using language that's going to be understandable to us as reader, but also using things to shape from the perspective of a child. Mm. So the idea of who they are fo uh, being followed by when it talks about the rivers and when it talks about um uh, the the different terms that they have that are clearly about the forkle seal yes um but it's the sort of the mishearing and mispronunciation that a child would use because they don't know the word and okay. so much of what badal goes through is learning the word learning how to identify the thing by giving it its true name and yeah. understanding it and i think that is a, a powerful thing that runs through so i think it is an extension of something that has been explored previously like the chain of dogs but giving us a new perspective on it it fulfills the function of showing us the danger that is actually lying ahead of the malazans that yeah. they are unaware of right uh, the power of what they are facing because again it's resurrecting the the fork of the seal and where have we met them before in house of chains yeah. when we thought they were just three barbarians going on a quest to kill children and then we realize that they are giants and this fork of the seal without any effort whatsoever beats the tar out of them that's yeah. how yeah. powerful this force is that is following these children so understanding the context is implying the threat and you know it may not work for everyone but i thought that was so nice that it's not just being spelled out as another melodramatic oh look there's a dark empire who we're going to go and fight right, right. yeah <laughs> but i thought we all have it personal would, preferences i mean these things take on more importance and resonance and you begin to see oh i see what he was doing here and it's similar with Kalith and the uh kachane jamal that she's with and you're like wait who is this lady and what what is, she's the wait she's the pedestrian for this particular uh colony of, of kachane jamal that was appointed by this crazy matron i mean that's what you get the next part in the, the, the prologue um and, where yeah go ahead and and immediately you go oh this new thing that oh red mask storyline oh yep. right we're getting the conclusion to Red Mask storyline. We realize it wasn't yeah. Red Mask's storyline. It right. was the Kachin Chamal storyline and yeah. Red Mask was the point of view that we had of it. So it yeah. wasn't Red Mask's storyline. It's the Kachin Chamal storyline. And now we see Caliph is there. And now we're getting yeah. the Kachin Chamal perspective. Memories of Ice. We had the story about the matron and aspects of the matron and we saw how much she loved talk and loved to give him a hug we we had that we had the undead <laughs> in Shemal. and over the course of the books there have been breadcrumbs and hints 
and it's gotten more and more and more as we have gone on. There were glimpses of sky keeps in the Imperial Warren. You know, we've had these glimpses and now this is coming to fruition. This is, no, we've explored different aspects of it always externally. Now let's delve into that internal perspective Yep. from the different points of view of the people involved in the Kachian storyline. Yeah, and, and the people, plural, because we now get with inside the heads of characters like Gunth Mach and uh, Sag Turok, who were just, you know, they were monsters earlier, right? They were just these silent, menacing monsters accompanying poor Red Mask. Uh, back in Reaper's Gale, and suddenly, I think for the first time, we're actually getting their perspective, and they're being humanized. The Kachain Chamal are being humanized. Yes, they have a very different brain in some ways. They have a different perspective from ours, uh, but there are so many insights we can see a lot of ourselves in these creatures as well, and what they're experiencing, and that it's a little bit like seeing a different culture and understanding oh okay well i guess they see things a little differently from the way i do but uh that doesn't mean it's invalid and they have reasons for that um so it's interesting to see that perspective offered in here for the first time and and i think the the point that you just made there about it being analogous to encountering a foreign culture yeah frequently when we encounter something we don't understand we we otherize it it is yep. made into the other and if we think of the Kachin Chamal, they were always framed as the monstrous other. And now we start getting a glimpse into it. And as you said, like they are humanized, they become people. And we realize that although some aspects of how they think about the world are alien and different, there are elements about how they think about the world that actually are very, very similar to how we think. And our differences in some respects are like they're giant lizards with some of them have swords for arms, some of them have wings. They were birthed by a hive mother. You know, it's, yeah, they're different, but they are still people. They may not be human, but they are still people and they're not monsters. And I think how Erickson uses just that subtle shift of perspective yeah. to change my mind about these giant velociraptors with sword for arms that are the cool dinosaur alien things running around killing people and make them into people yeah you know, that's that's a fairly impressive trick of writing absolutely even even the shigal assassin that accompanies them on oh, their quest i mean he he seems to be goo roll or however you say that he seems to be at first but then you know you get a bit of his perspective and you realize his interest is pr protecting his people. He's trying. And the idea that this little puny human is somehow going to help them. I mean, he's got a point, right? I mean, that the, the matron seems like she's really lost it here in putting forward this little human who's supposed to find their shield anvil and their mortal sword, right? So you can see where the skepticism and, and he's conflicted. Uh, Gurol is. And I love how Erickson plays with that conflict within him and the side that he ultimately takes and the sacrifice he ultimately makes by the end when he's on the same side as the Malazans and they're fighting against the short tails and, and all that. I mean, you get a really different view of that character, I think, through the course of the book. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a, a character who is a cynical historian who thinks that the military expedition they're on is a waste of time. But as they yeah. travel on it and have some sort of dogs on a chain, um, grows to understand and respect what it is that they are doing, comes to a new realization. And because we've been with that perspective, we then identify with it and are persuaded by it. I wonder where I've seen that technique used before. I don't know. You're pulling this analogy out of nowhere, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's when you see something like that and you go, yeah, yeah that, this, this is actually what Duiker did with the chain of dogs. Yeah. And you go, the same pattern, the same resonance, but in a very different context and for a different reason, yeah. exploring a different aspect. And so it's, it's this wonderful use of a pattern uh, without it being repetitive. And even the, the greater understanding of what it is that, or why it is 
that the Kachin Chamal wanted red mask, that they want Caliph, that they want these things. The fact that they are a dying race and how are they going to survive? And they need a future. They need a new way to conceptualize things because we find out, much like the, the Bene Gesserit in June, hmm. you know, they have this ancestral memory. So they've actually just been constantly redoing the same things over and over again until this mad matron decides to do something different. And she has broken the mold, which is one of the reasons why she's, you know, they all go, she's mad. She's, she's not doing the things that she should do. You're only meant to have a certain number of warriors. She has birthed all of these warriors. Yeah. We are meant to do things this way, but she's recruited humans to try and, you can see why if someone did that in our society, we'd go, you're insane. Right. And they're going, our current trajectory is annihilation. How do we stop that? We have to have a radical solution. Yep. And her solution is this, to go outside. And then when we think of the tribes uh, on Genabakis, when we think of all of those nations that were conquered by the Malazans. Now, again, Erickson is very clear that colonialism and, and imperialism are not necessary, they're not good. But when it talked about those tribes and why Coltane sided with the Malazans, because right. the emperor said, you're killing each other. You're going to wipe each other out. I can give you peace and I will respect your individual tribe. And I'll do it for everyone. And you can keep your cultural identity, but you become part of the empire. Now, there's always a trade-off. There's No one is saying it is as simple and simplistic as that. But I think that's part of what we're seeing here. Humans acting as the agent of change for an ossified social structure. And in this yeah. place, they are in, in this case, the Kachin Chamal. Yep, absolutely. Well, speaking of madness and patterns coming into focus, <laughs> the next part of the prologue deals with Icarium and, or I suppose we could say Sheb, Taxilian, Veed, and Featherwitch or Breath, as she's called here, or Asane and Last, that, that whole group of, uh, well, who's the ghost here? Uh, you know, that's, it's an interesting, uh, really, I mean, I, I can recall the first time, this is my second time reading this, of course, so I wasn't surprised this time, but the first time reading it, I was absolutely blown away by how cool this was, the idea of all these voices. And at first it is presented as a, as a party, as a group of people. Um, but I think you figure out fairly quickly that what we're dealing with here is a lot of voices in one person's mind and that person being Icarium. Uh, that is tipped, I think, right here in the prologue. Uh, yeah. And, so, and um, th This is an interesting one. I know that some people think that the reveal that it's a carrium comes much later on in the book. No, I, no, no. I am of the opinion and I'm adamant. No, you know, it's a carrium from the prologue. First of all, it, it describes the, the initial description of him as a ghost and then right. he wants to live. So it's, there's already a contradiction in this. Then with names like Taxilian, you remember who Taxilian is and you go, he's, right. he's deep. He's He's done. Yeah. And then there's the paragraph. Terror like me was squished under a huge pile of a piece of uh, building. So, I mean, yeah. And then there's the paragraph that follows this section where we get all of the, and yes, they do have slightly different names. It is ambiguous. I, yeah. I grant everyone that, but then there's a section, one paragraph underneath it, where it talks about the Cape moths that are following this single green figure with tusks armed right. with a sword. It's right there. Yeah. Yeah. When I read that, the first time I read that, I went, oh, it's a carrium. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I appreciate that it is not necessarily obvious. For whatever reason, my brain immediately went to a carrium and I went, right, right, fine. Yeah. And then I looked back at the paragraph and even though they had different names, I recognized some of the names and then I put together that breath was Feather Witch. Yeah. But, and as soon as I did that, that consolidates everything and i did that in the prologue and i'm not saying it's because i was smart i was lucky or for whatever reason my brain went there uh, 
It's but, interesting to think, though, about the mechanism whereby this happened at the end of Reaper's Gale. Near the end, you have this massive explosion caused by the machine that Icarium is reunited with, one of his old machines. And that also has a lot to do with the new Warrens and all this other stuff that's going on. So all these threads are really important. Um, but somehow the souls or the personalities of these people were imprinted onto Icarium in that moment when that explosion happened. That's that's how I took it anyway. Um, so, uh, and some of them are people that he wasn't personally interacting with, but were dying at that moment, like Feather Witch, you know, she, she was being drowned deep below the city uh, by everybody's favorite uh, god, Erastus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but she, she died at a similar moment, I believe, in Reaper's Gale. I didn't look back and, and, and verify that, but it's all these people who died in that moment when that explosion occurred are somehow imprinted, you know, in, in his head. So, uh, and he's carrying these, he, they're the ghosts that he's carrying around with him, I suppose. Yeah, yeah and they, in some respects, they, they reflect different facets of who a carrier is. Yeah. And, uh, you can play around with different psychological analysis of it. And I think it might be very interesting to actually sit down and try and do a whole thing exploring that. But one of the, the aspects of it is, of course, for him to take control, he must kill off these other personalities. Yeah. So for someone who has his entire life had, or not his entire, for most of how we've known about him, has been without memory, has been without a true personality because he can't make new memories. Right. He kills off all of these other people by using the violent betrayer, Tarlac Veed, yeah. the, that memory, that soul, that image, to kill off the others so he can become in control. And then, of course, it ends up melding with Ampelus, or not, it, not Ampelus rooted, it's the other one. Um, yeah. Um, Kals rooted? Kals rooted, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, obviously keeping an eye out for the errand. Yeah. Uh, but that is so uh, fundamental for the end because this is, he melds with this. It becomes then a way to patch the seal. And so when we think of all of the stuff that we've had with the thinnest, all the stuff that we've had with the Azath, all the stuff that we've had in the previous books about rents and how to fix them, that yeah. all of those elements find fruition in this moment. So yeah. all of those things that we, the, oh, in Guards of the Moon, it's a Deus Ex Machina. We don't know anything about this. And all the way, oh, in Memories of Ice, oh, this thing, oh, why is that there? And oh, a little jagged kid was thrown into it, um, blah, blah, blah. You know, all the way through, we've had these explorations of what is a finist? How is a finist created? How is an Azath created? And at the end, the character most associated with the destruction of the Azath is creating essentially a new Azath, a new way to hold this rent closed. And yeah. we suddenly see that conclusion of an arc in wow. retrospect. That's full circle right there. Wow. Very cool. Well, another character who's undergone quite the transformation is Hiboric, who has become quite a witness to uh, events, hasn't he? I mean, he, he concludes the prologue, a little bit about Hiboric. And uh, you, you made your video about this section of the prologue already, um, but anything additional that you wanna say about it? Well, when I, the, the, when I talked about Hiboric's section, I wasn't talking about the actual diegetic information that gets revealed True. here. Because yeah. while we've, we've talked about those aspects that sort of form elements that are going to be explored and going to be important, um, the section with Haboric, it's almost like that someone drawing back the curtain to show you elements. Because we have an image of the short tails, an image of a Naruk in its armor, standing next to a, a crucified dragon. Mm. on a platform so it's not that this is just something that's been randomly done this has been in place for a while and the platform has gutters so yeah. we realize this this has been done for a long time um so the the short tails are introduced here and you go oh, that's funny 
there's a Kachin Chamal perspective earlier on. Their enemy was the Naruk. Obviously, they're slaves that broke away because the Kachin bioengineered slaves that then freed themselves. Who are the bad guys? Who are the good guys? But yeah, yeah. What's interesting is we know, and we've had little hints throughout that the short tails were the ones that designed the flying citadels that yeah. and we've had glimpses of those in the imperial warrant we've had glimpses of threats about the um Nuruk, the short tails appearing right all of that is again little breadcrumbs seeded through the entire series and suddenly in this reveal of let's peel back the layers and talk about what's here one of them is standing next to a dragon and the nails going through the dragon are rust colored no mm. open to interpretation but it could be dried blood you know we, we sometimes have Unlikely. dried blood called rust colored yeah yeah or but, ochre ochre colored perhaps yeah ochre um do we do we have any any discussion or or thoughts about what an ochre dragon could be <laughs> I do believe so. I do believe so. So yeah, we're talking about Otateral here, aren't we? Yeah. And suddenly like that is brought into foot. And it's a little throwaway line. It's a little description that when you're reading through and you, you're trying to get onto the next thing, you're, you're not necessarily paying attention to what you've just been told. Oh, it's a crucified dragon. We've seen those before. Yeah. And that actually ties into, if you think about it, uh, previous prologues where we heard about uh, Kilimanderos and how she hated or the, uh, they hated dragons and loathed the alien and wanted to kill them all. And lo and behold, that's one of the threads that we explore here. The errant being the Machiavellian idiot, but thinking he's a genius, yeah. trying to manipulate uh, Sekulath and Kilimanderos. And of course, They've been planning this for ages without telling him because he'd removed himself from the board. He was playing in Lether and they've been going, no, we, we need to do things. And it's every time the errant thinks he's a power player, we've seen this time and time again. <laughs> he, he's overestimated his own abilities. He is so arrogant. He can't conceive that other people are more powerful, that other people are smarter. And of course, now his eye is forever looking into this rent and it's connected by magic so he's gonna have a bit of a headache for a while oh yeah for sure yeah well i don't know about uap but i've seen so many crucified dragons that i just ignore them every time i come across another you know so <laughs> dime a dozen dime a dozen um yeah i think that covers that pretty well then so we can move into the uh the, the first chapter or just the book itself uh there are various threads that we can tackle here i think and Speaking of uh, things that we think we might know, but are presented in an entirely different light. How about that reading of the deck of dragons, uh, which sets up so, so much. And you, you mentioned the errant, uh, he, or Erastus, he tries to, his best to uh, take that over to become the master of the deck, as well as the master of the tiles. That doesn't go so well. <laughs> uh, but there's, I mean, when Fiddler does this reading, something happens that never happened before the cards fly into people and pin them on the wall. I mean, it's a pretty dramatic scene, wouldn't you say? And, and this is, we've seen the, uh, the deck of dragons has been built up again and again as not only a divining tool, but deeply connected to the rivers of magic, the warrens, the holes, yeah. um, aspects of, of magic in the world. And of course, when the Malazans first arrived on Letharus, they, they went, this is weird. Warrens don't work here the way that they normally do. And then we have obviously the uh, explosion created by Icaria. And of course, during the course of this book, we realized that that explosion, that right. machine was, he was trying to recreate what uh, Kroll did. Um, and we now have either the fracturing of some warrens, the creation of new warrens, new ways of perceiving warrens, or simply new access two concepts in the world that have been given metaphysical form. Right. We're not quite sure of the mechanism. It was built by a carrier and he can't remember how he did it. Right. But um, this actually ties in, I think, uh, partially to something from uh, Ian C. Asselmont's novels of the Mars and Empire, 
Oh yeah. And I'm not going to mention the, the specifics because it's a bit of a spoiler for those things, but it, yeah. we've talked about it before, but the reconstruction of Krull into a new entity yeah. is not necessarily happening at exactly the same time, but they are close enough together when you think about it in terms of history that you go, that's a coincidence that Kroll is reconstituted, reformed into a yeah. kind of new entity. And we have a new form of magic being established in the world. Yep, yep. And if you've read this far in the series, you know that Kroll is central to the Warrens, that they are in some sense or other his, his flesh and blood, that, that he made this possible um and that uh, whatever carrium did drastically affected him um so yeah and we've, we've seen the the deck of dragons uh, even in memories of ice the uh, the card underneath that makes the table fly that yeah the unexpected reactions from the deck of dragons why fiddler dreads doing it and he even mentions that as time has gone on his talent has deepened it's he's becoming more and more adept that this connection is worryingly strong now yeah and with so many ascendants and gods uh focused on this relatively small area of the world there's a lot of magical attention here and yeah. so that's when we start seeing the the different power plays being made by these ascendants like kilmanderos and, and uh, knuckles and Mail then having to intervene and, and sort of have a chat to them. And the repercussions of the death of Anamander Rick. Yes. And what that means to people. Yep. Because they are shocked at this happening. Even people who didn't like him. Mm. And there's respect for him. Even if they disagreed with him, there is respect for who Rick was and people working out what went on and trying to work it out so the repercussions of told the hound um who'd manifesting now now that his his form reappearing on his throne and going right and the re-emergence of the jagger yeah with their odd sense of humor <laughs> yeah which i love yeah so many elements are, I mean, talk about convergence. The entire series is having its convergence. You can feel it coming in Dust of Dreams. You also have what's going on. I mean, I'm skipping ahead a little here by even mentioning this, but what's going on with the Amas and how uh, it's actually Sita Aranicht, who is with um, uh, with Breeze, uh, along with, you know, they're accompanying the Malazans. And she is feeling this, this weird stuff is going on with magic everywhere, it, everywhere. And it's all kind of being brought together. And, and you can feel it coming. You just feel like everything is being brought to a head here with all of these threads and what's going on with the Warrens and all this stuff is just being sucked into this. And so when we think about the convergence that's building up here, we have the Forkel Asil making an appearance, a long forgotten race. We have the yep. Jagat, a long forgotten ancient race making an appearance. We yep. have the Kachin Chamal, a long forgotten race. You go, hang on a sec this this is drawing in the mythological powers and we have the imas we have the bargas the descendants of the imas we have the humans we we have all of these different races and it's becoming a very crowded playing field yep. and seeing all of these things come to a head seeing the this clash of old versus new the clash of uh, the, the new young races and their way of doing things, new Warrens versus the old Warrens versus the Holds. All of this is about the past clashing with the present and what that means for the future. What is the future of this world? Yeah. Um, and I, I find it fascinating that the, uh, you, you had mentioned uh, the Sita, the Antri Sita. Yes. And she had the, the uh, dirt that was moving on its own. And it yeah. turns out, oh, it was a bit of an imas. Whoops. And it's the, the fallen imas, the unbound. Yeah. The ones that we had met previously. You go, yeah. and they've turned up again. It's all of these things. People go, oh, but this just comes out of nowhere. You go, oh no. The foregrounding, the foreshadowing for all of these different elements. It, they, they've been there all along and quite often it's only when we look back when we look back along that line of books 
to think about where these people came from, where these seeds were sown, that we realize that, no, there is an arc. It is connecting. These aren't just randomly thrown in. Even the undead eye, uh, the undead wolf, and talk coming back, and uh, giving the wolf the name, what is the name of the wolf? Oh, yes. Uh, Ball Jag. Yeah. yeah. Um, whatever. But again, the, the focus on uh, the relationship between them, but also the relationship between the Imas and the I. Yeah. These, these relationships that we've explored and seen, again, being shown to us again, showing in a different light. Yeah. Talk's relationship with Tull. The um, Tull, initially undead, Talk alive. Talk undead, Tull alive. Both of them undead. Like they are going through these different iterations. It is complex, but we see this byplay. We see these echoes. We see this resurgence of these, these previous aspects of narrative coming to a head at the end. It's a return to, do you remember when these were introduced? Here they are. This is why they were in that story earlier on. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's so there's so much to talk about here, but I guess we could keep our focus on the Malazans for now and talk about that journey that you mentioned before they get rolled over by the short tails. A lot of other things do happen uh, and a lot of exploring happens as well. Some of our favorites like Fiddler and his squad, including Smiles and Korik and, uh, and Korab and Cuddle. And you see a, a kind of disillusionment among many of the Malazans, I think, which is most embodied in uh, the high fist, uh, what's his name? The one who was at um, in Dead House Gates. Sorry, Blistig. Yeah, Blistig. Yeah, you see that disillusionment really embodied in in Blistig, who I think you have to remember, and I've said this before, uh, and you probably have too. You have to remember this Blistig was in some ways the hero of Dead House Gates because he refused to obey the order, which was obviously stupid uh, that uh, Pormqual was giving. Uh, and, and so that saved the day in a sense. That same characteristic, that those, those same personality is, has resulted in, in a person who is very much broken in this current situation. He's traumatized by the fact that he has had a leader make a very poor decision in the past. And for him, from his perspective, what Tavor is doing is every bit as disastrous as what Pormqual was doing. So that's his perspective here. If in case you're inclined to see him as you know, a, a less than admirable person. Uh, and he, yeah, he makes mistakes. He does, he, he's bitter and, and all of that, but keep that perspective in mind. And of course, Tavor uh, is, you know, I think we really see into her mind much more than in any previous book here. Um, and the stresses that she's under, the, the, um, the burden of leadership and, the relationship that she has to her followers is a major facet. And she is one of the leaders that I spoke about in the uh, non-spoiler video um, in, in terms of the portrayal of leadership here. Um, she and um, Jan Tovis, Twilight, and obviously uh, Tool is another one. I mean, it's just, it's all over the place here. Um, so, but anyway, focusing on the Malazans, there's, there's just a lot of cool stuff going on here. And one of the things that I, I think is interesting is obviously we had the, the chain of dogs and then in House of Chains, we obviously had uh, the bone hunters retrace the chain of dogs, but without the refugees. Right. And now we're seeing basically the bone hunters make the chain of dogs march themselves, but in a different place. Yeah. And where Coltane was removed, he didn't confide in people. He wasn't um, warm and chummy. He didn't explain his actions. He didn't right. take people into his confidence. All we saw of Coltian was inscrutable. Yeah. But people believed in him. And as they went on, as they kept winning, people believed more and more in him. But we, we had all of those moments where it was, no one knows what Coltian is thinking. And yet when we see Tavor do this, well, she should tell people what she's thinking. You know, hang on, this is exactly what Coltian did. Why is it okay for Coltian to do it, but not her? Yeah. Um, and we see 
elements of that. And I think you were very right to point out the, the issue with Blisted. If yeah. in the past your leader has made disastrous decisions, are you going to look at your new leader and go, oh, well, they're clearly always going to make great decisions. And this is one of the, the difficulties that we have sometimes, separating reader knowledge from character knowledge. A character has a perspective and we have far more knowledge of a lot of different events that they cannot know about. And it's uh, Wolfgang Ezer. I was one of my commenters or a couple of my commenters corrected my pronunciation. Wolfgang Ezer's gap theory okay, about okay. The, the gap of knowledge because he's looking at it from she's not telling me where we're going. She's not telling me why we're going there. She, she's not telling me any of her plans. She's not confiding in me. Right. And instead of seeing how his attitude is making her less and less wanting to confide in him, and in fact, maybe she's not confiding because she doesn't want to burden other people. Right. He sees it very much as, oh, we're all just going to die. And once you get on that spiral, how do you dig yourself out of it? Yeah, yeah. And how many times has Tavor turned the omen oh the the bone and then they all became bone hunters oh they um yigatan was a disaster except oh look they crawled out from underneath and they they won they defeated um drizna and uh, the the army of the apocalypse they, they've won not in a straight up rock'em sock'em robot fist fight but no. they keep winning they got to mala city they didn't get beaten there they got all, of, oh, we're going to invade uh, Lethras, this continent. We're not going to have any backup. Oh, and we won. Doesn't matter how many times she wins. People, oh, well, she just was lucky. Hmm. And it, it's amazing how often luck goes hand in hand with competence and planning. Yeah, absolutely. And you do have a contrast to Blistig in people like Keneb, you know, uh, who is a much more... I think uh, sympathetic character for most of us as we're reading this. He's he's on the right side. He trusts Tavor, even when he has doubts. You know, he he actually does the right thing. But he's the one who ends up basically road pizza. You know, at, <laughs> in the in, in that scene and when the the Naruk roll over the Malazans. Um, so I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, and then of course you have the 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 backbone of the Malazans, the, the fiddlers, you know, of uh, the, the people who, who understand the psychology of what's going on and are actively, though covertly, helping Tavor without really knowing the whole plan all the time. Although you have your quick Ben, who seems to know more than he ought to. Um, and you even well, have- I'm gonna say, yes, quick Ben knows more than he ought to, but I also think that he bluffs an awful lot about what he knows. True, he lets on that he true. knows even more. Yeah, yeah, true. And then there's Bottle, who, you know, he he does his eavesdropping with his little friends and, and that sort of thing. So, um, but but yeah, you, you do have plenty of examples of loyalty. And it's not blind loyalty either. You mentioned all of their victories. Tavor has earned that. She's earned the respect, I think, uh, and the devotion of this army. Um, and sometimes they just need some reminding of it. But they're in a... They're in a bleak situation and it gets bleaker and bleaker as the, the book progresses. Um, and of course, a lot of that is also due to what's happening with their allies who are going through their own uh, uh, difficulties as they're proceeding along the way. So you have, I guess we could talk about the Kundril perhaps first and led by Gaul, war leader Gaul, who have been, you know, they've been, taken advantage of by the locals uh, and uh, the, the Bokondo, I guess. Uh, and so there, there's some rising antagonism going on there and he's having to deal with, you know, it's not an easy thing to lead an army in a time of war, but try leading a bored army in a time of peace. Uh, and you know, he's dealing with, the, with that and the growing antagonism between his people and the locals. And ultimately an incident happens and things blow up in a big way. And a lot of cool stuff, I think, is done with Gaul in this book. As somebody looking back on the past and his relationship on a very personal level with his wife and, and, uh, and his people and, and the, uh, another leader 
by the way, who has to make some very difficult decisions, uh, I think. So uh, interesting part of the narrative. And one of the I've, one of the things that's so fascinating about that is obviously they, they were initially a rival of the Crow clan. They, they were rivals with Coltane. But seeing Coltane's sacrifice, seeing what Coltane achieved, yeah. They were in awe of him, just like uh, mentioned earlier on about Anamanda Rick. Even his enemies respected him and could admire aspects of him. So when was the last time we heard in, in modern day discourse uh, a rival being described in anything but negative terminology? Because you can't admit that your rivals have positive attributes. Of course not, yeah. they're villains. But even a nemesis has some positive attributes, right? <laughs> <laughs> nemesis but one of the things that I, I find fascinating about him is he does not want that initial fight right. but he goes because this has happened they are going to think x the only way that we can deal with this is y therefore you know what let's just commit to this that is what we're going to have we're going to go going straight to the capital boom you know yeah and he thinks through the strategy he makes the decision he goes right yeah. Now that our actions have resulted in this, we can't just hang around here. This is going to be bad. Let's right. go. Let's do this because then we can win. And it's brutal. It, it's not the action of a hero. If this was a heroic novel, he would have gone out and brokered peace and everyone would have been happy. That's what the hero in a traditional narrative would have done. He's like, nope. Let's do this. He makes a pragmatic decision that is cold, is rational, will result in victory and is unexpected by the enemy. And yeah. there was provocation, but the provocation was in terms of trade and limitation of access. Much like the Moranth, who were the trade rivals at Peel and exacted their R of revenge. Yep. Hmm. These things keep coming up. Yeah, All interesting. Yeah. But one of, the, one of the things that I actually really enjoyed about him, he's cast as a barbarian. He is cast mm -hmm. as this tribal leader. And right. that's when we get the exterior, uh, the external perspective of him from the other uh, parties, particularly the queen. That's what right. she initially thinks of him. Right. The, book the, the queen of the Bokondo. Yeah. 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 And the, the commander of the Everntine Legion. Yes. Uh, but so she initially, you know, thinks of him as a barbarian. But of course, she's there with. Uh, the leader of the Gilk, isn't it? Gilk? Yeah, the Gilk. Yeah, the Bargast, that, that group of Bargasts. Yeah. Um, and so she has a different appreciation of it. And we seeing that internal perspective, his relationship with his wife, the fact that he knows that a number of his children are, are not technically his. And she goes, right. but you've been riding on a saddle for 40 years. Like, what did you expect? <laughs> um, There's some bouncing around that happens when you ride that much. Yeah. And we see the complexity of that life, that he loves his wife, his, life has ha uh, his wife has had these affairs, but right. he's and his so wife. He, he has a lover too, of course. And, yeah. and he has a lover, not yeah. necessarily a female one, which again, right. you know, it's part of woven into just this is, we're going to talk about this character and this character has a life. And that exploration just to encompass the fact that there is a domestic life. There is a life that exists beyond the, their function as a war leader. Yeah. That, yeah I, I enjoyed that relationship between him and his wife. I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten her name at the moment, but um, I think it's really well done. You can just sense the layers and the history. And, and there, there are things in that that are warm and wonderful to reflect on and there's pain as well you know um and it, it's just a, such a true portrayal of a relationship that has gone on for years and years um, and it is woven into gaul's thinking i think about his people like what have i left my children what have i done to my children um as a result of the way we as a culture uh, have have gone about things um so it's, it's personal and it's also cultural i think and but that creates such complexity instead of just going oh it's just a tribal society oh it's a clan of savages we are again challenged with these our preconceptions and we're challenged to look beyond them and go they are 
people, they have family. People will always have other people they love. Yeah. And seeing that byplay between him and the queen and him and uh, the leader of the guild, that their conversations and their evolving relationship. <clears throat> yep. And contrasting that with the, the parish greyhounds mm -hmm. who are fascinating because obviously with the grey swords and a coviet oh well, we know who the parish are and that is what the malazans think right but through this we go that's not a coviet he no. is that is definitely not a coviet it is the sith yeah. Yeah. the sith version of a coviet <laughs> i'm only going to take on the pain of those that are worthy, of those that are mine. But I don't like you, I disagree with you. So the antithesis of who Itkovian was. And for yeah. all the criticism that Itkovian gets for his taking the pain of the Imas, for making those decisions when he did, do we prefer this version? Yeah, well, I think it's it's more complex than than an either or though, because with Tanakalian, you do have a character who is l certainly less sympathetic on the surface than Itkovian. Uh, but is he wrong all the time? I don't. I think that's a question that's worth exploring, actually, because he might actually have a point. Uh, you know, Itkovian, you could argue. Uh, embracing all the pain and and distributing absolution. Is that actually a responsible thing to do? And what does it lead to? Whereas Tanakalian seems much more discerning. Let's put it that way. That's a positive spin on it, right? He seems to be much more, no, these people are are wrong. And I want to, I think he has motives that are not nefarious, right? Um, so I think it's it's complex, in other words. He's not just a, a you know mustache twirling villain here, is he? This is exactly what we talked about in Toll the Hounds about the Redeemer. Yeah, that's right. Is it, should it be extended to everyone? Do you have to earn it? These are questions that are asked. And suddenly, lo and behold, oh, yeah. look, those questions that we suggested be asked. They, oh, are they being asked in this book as well? Oh, where <laughs> did that come from out of nowhere that's just invented? Yep. Um, and that is, again, sometimes having a character articulate views that are questions that we asked and you go coming from them it seems a lot more sinister yeah but just because it's slightly more sinister, does that still make it wrong and again it's this investigation of it but we can see the power of the worship of the god of war right where the the gray swords seem to be quite noble and dedicating themselves to defending a lost cause right that doesn't seem to be what the parish are doing. The Greyhounds seem much more about finding a great and glorious battle. Right. And which is a criticism that Tanakalian has of Krugava. Now we are inclined to sympathize with her. She is awesome. She's a great charismatic leader. She's very perceptive. But is he wrong that she's looking for some glorious way out and dragging her entire group of, you know, uh, Greyhounds along with her? Uh, is is he right that she is rigid and unbending in some ways, uh, whereas he has a much more flexible morality, which maybe has a place. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, describing that as a flexible morality is such yeah. a beautiful euphemism. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I'm doing my best here, but for the guy. And but. and I take your point because that is that when people say that they want morally great characters. Quite often, we want simplified forms of morally great character. Oh, they're a cool character, but they have this one flaw. Yeah. And when we're presented with truly complex characters that are neither good nor bad, but are all different shades of gray, you know, the way that humanity is, sometimes we find that we go, oh, but it's too contradictory. You go, have you met people? People are contradictory. <laughs> yes. But they're consistent in their contradictions, if that makes yeah. any sense. It does, yeah. Um, and that's what I find so fascinating, that this is a mirror of a different 
way through a mirror darkly of how we could have seen the gray swords and yeah. it's it's a fascinating just shifting of the lens to give a different perspective on it and to ask those questions like is the worship of the god of war good mm. they, they literally worship going to kill people right, not right. the god of hunting for food to feed your family the god of going out and conquering people and right. how did we ever see that as something that should be worshipped that should be seen as good yeah it, and it's those questions yeah so a glory seeker like krugava i mean by the standards of many societies that is a very admirable person right but if you look at it that way the way you just explained it um you know you're you're basically you're going around seeking out ways to kill other people and look great doing it you know um so but then again, you, we could if you can be on the, the side of right you know um so the just war doctrine um, yeah. mm. but even think about krugava is she deliberately seeking out a legendary battle so that they can fall uh -huh. or is she dedicating them to something worthwhile that they can lend their aid to yep and, and again, it's, there isn't, it's not easy and simple to just put your finger on it. It's right. asking the question, weighing up the evidence and privileging and weighting the evidence in certain ways and seeing yeah. how, depending on how you organize it, you can come to different results. And that, that ambiguity, that space for a reader to inhabit is a great power of this no, yeah. no. There's there's actually still quite a lot more to talk about. So what I'm going to suggest, because time is actually running on a little uh, here, mm -hmm. is that um, you and I meet again, and we follow up with some of the the aspects of the story that we haven't had a chance to discuss sure. because there's a lot about the the Bargast and yeah. uh, Hetan that I want to discuss. I think it's important to discuss, but I don't want to rush through it. Okay. And there's a lot about tool and talk that I think yeah. is of an interest. And the shake. And the shake. And I think that, again, is a, an important aspect that we, we need to address. But don't want to rush through it. So would that suit you, my friend? It would suit me fine. <laughs> so I think we will, we will proceed thusly. And this has been a lot of fun, though. And I thank you and I thank your viewers for putting up with me <laughs> and uh, just, I can't wait to, to finish uh, talking about this and moving on to the crippled God. And then finally a sale when we're going to wrap up both series. Uh, I'm very excited for all of this. So thank you. And, AP. and they should be happening relatively rapidly. No, <laughs> yeah. I know people have had to wait, but I'm feeling better now. So I can, we, we, we'll just read, knock them, uh, knock them out. But, Thank you so much, Philip. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for the conversation. As ever, it, it is always revealing to talk about these things with you. And I deeply appreciate that. And uh, I would also like to say thank you very much for those of you still watching. Thank you for your support. And we will see you in the next one.